today is, is, a, is another important day in, in terms of uh, the guidance and support we've been providing to the field from early childhood through higher ed. And today we're releasing guidance um, that will continue to provide you know, both additional guidance and support and to engage, and to engage with our local stakeholders um, to, uh, you know, to look at um, you know, the conditions by which we can um, and we should, uh, we should open schools. Please know that as we develop this guidance, we didn't do so alone in the department. We were very strategic in engaging with stakeholders across the Commonwealth and in, in schools, traditional um, and others, and working with key members of the General Assembly, working with um, district administrators, post-secondary institutions, um, and students. To this point, every decision we've made at PDE and what this guidance will show um, are decisions that allow us to create the conditions and to make recommendations that first and foremost keep students and staff safe and healthy. Our guiding principle in this was the health and safety of all of those who are engaging in our educational institutions. Secondly, providing guidance that will allow us to ensure continuity of education so that students can be better prepared for post-secondary access through institutions and more better prepared to enter the workforce and better prepared to transition from grade to grade. But at the end of the day, we realize that these decisions cannot and have not been made in a vacuum. We will continue to work in consultation with the Department of Health, guidance by the review guidance by the CDC to, uh, you know, to update um, you know, our guidance to the field based on current research, based on data, and not only here in, across states in the U.S., but we've been engaging international data to, you know, to both identify what works, what's being tried, and the efficacy of different strategic plans that have, that have moved forward. But no, I think as we engage our stakeholders and we create conditions, best case scenario, to allow students to come back to school um, traditionally for, for the next school year, to looking at hybrid models if, if the need arises. Our role in this space is to provide guidance that allows all educational institutions to look a little more specifically around identifying, sharing, and providing uh, school opening guidance that best meets the needs of, of their community and meets the needs of their learners. So um, with that being said, why don't I open it up and, and try my best to answer questions that uh, you all may have. Uh, hold on, uh, Secretary Rivera. Um, I think at this point we're going to give uh, Matt Stem is going to do a short intro of some of the guidance we provided. Yep. Sorry, Rick. I apologize. I jumped the gun to the next uh, to the next point. I realized that uh, although we released the guidance, I want I'd like to uh, you know uh, pass uh, pass this opportunity over to our exec our Deputy Secretary of Elementary and Secondary Ed, uh, Matt Stem, to provide updates on the K to 12 um, guidance for everyone. Thanks, Rick. Thank you, Secretary Rivera. So over the past three months, the department's been engaging stakeholders around school reopening, and a common theme has been the need for timely guidance. The preliminary guidance being released today is an important first step and speaks to ensuring the health and safety of our students, staff, and school communities as they explore future options. Each school district in the yellow or green phases that chooses some return to in-person instruction can begin piloting strategies with students as early as July 1st. In order to do so, they'll need to create local health and safety plans, have those plans approved by their local school boards, submit those plans to the state, and post them on their websites prior to returning to any form of in-person instruction. The guidance being released today was heavily informed by CDC guidelines, as well as the PA Department of Health and other medical professionals. It includes topics such as cleaning, sanitizing, ventilation, and hygiene practices, among others. Although there are required elements within each plan, there is flexibility that allows school leaders and their stakeholders to operationalize practices at the local level. This Friday, the department will also be releasing a template aligned to this guidance that can optionally be used by school districts to meet requirements and to post on their websites. Future reports and tools are forthcoming on topics not addressed here, such as teaching and learning, student wellness, and equity and access, including how to best support vulnerable populations. We will continue to listen to educators and families in the weeks ahead and do everything we can to create the conditions for safety and learning in our school communities. 
At this time, uh, we'll turn it over to our Deputy Secretary for Higher Education, uh, Noe or Dr. Noe Ortega, who will share updates uh, on the post-secondary space. Thank you, Matt Stem, and uh, thank you everybody for joining today. Uh, similar to my colleague, uh, the preliminary guidance for post-secondary institutions and adult basic education providers has been released and is currently out there to inform the planning of institutions and educator, uh, adult education organizations. Um, what it will do is it will provide guidance for how to resume in-person instruction. As many of you recall, uh, during the COVID-19 uh, uh, disruptions, many of uh, all of the post-secondary institutions were asked to pivot to uh, virtual distance and remote education opportunities for their students to allow them to continue uh, the continuity of learning to complete the semester. Uh, we, as we get ready to release this guidance, what's going to change is that effective uh, June 5th, post-secondary institutions in yellow will be allowed to offer in-person instruction. The conditions are that they have to meet several expectations that the state has laid out. One of them is to develop their own public and health safety plan, which will be informed by uh, the work of local public health officials along with the institutional-led uh, response teams and planning teams, and then they will implement a number of strategies that will help them address some of the public health and safety measures that we see uh, have become uh, clear needs uh, through CDC and the Department of Health as well. Uh, additionally, we will be moving into uh, working with the institutions to understand what other services or in-person services uh, also uh, need to resume, and uh, uh, this will allow them to begin to embark on those post-secondary planning opportunities. I want to be clear that several assumptions are informing our decision, first and foremost, as the Secretary has shared with everyone, and my colleague Matt Stem as well, it is plans that are premised on the health and safety of the students, faculty, and staff in the institutions, and in many cases, the surrounding communities that they serve. It does acknowledge the need to make sure that we are um, aware of the diversity of the various communities and it allows institutions to develop something that is specific to the needs of their students and community. And then also it allows for folks to make a decision on whether or not they will choose to resume in-person instruction over the next course of months and at what level they will resume it. So it certainly does is not a requirement of folks having to move into that, but it gives them an opportunity to start planning. I'll pause there and uh, uh, give the mic back to the secretary as we move into answering some of the questions you may have. Hi everyone, this is <clears throat> Rick Levis again. I wanna remind you that we are recording this um, and we'll be issuing a PA cast later with links to the, to the audio and the video. Uh, we're gonna go down through the questions. I'm gonna announce the reporter and who's on deck. Uh, please, you'll have to unmute yourself, ask your question, and then we'll go down the list. Uh, first question is Jan Murphy from the Patriot News followed by Jackie Palaco at the morning call. Jan, are you on? Hi, uh, thank I am, can you hear me? We can, hear, we can me. hear you, it's a little echoey. Can you hear Yeah, I can hear me. you. Yep, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Can, can, Jan, Jan, we can hear you. Okay, well. Now we can't. Jan, are you still there? Um, great. Um, I was just wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on, you know, the. the Jan, we're, lo we're losing you. I was wondering if you can hear me. Yep. Can can you um, we're good. We can't hear you. We're gonna. Yeah, we can't hear. We're gonna. Jan, we'll come back to you. We're gonna go move on to Jackie Palaco right now. Jackie, are you on? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, you can. Um, yeah, Secretary, I was just wondering if you could give some more details about what in-person classes could look like, um, especially for those under the yellow phase. Will PDE recommend how many students can be in a classroom? Um, and will that require a hybrid of some sorts with students that are in the classroom and others doing online classes? That's a great question. As we're releasing the guidance to the school districts, um, and I think it's important to mention that first and foremost, uh, we engage stakeholders, we engage district leaders um, as we drafted this response. 
So what we're going to identify is not specifically how many students in a classroom nor an occupancy model as much as what you've seen around business and industry, but what social distancing guidelines are um, you know, within the classroom and looking at transition time and transition space and congregate um, you know, space and, and congregate time. And so what, we go, what the guidance is going to uh, provide is, is with a little more specificity, how much room should exist, how much space should there be between um, students in the classroom and other individuals um, you know, within that classroom as well. So based on those specific social distancing guidance, um, school, schools can then personalize um, those expectations to meet the needs of their classroom. And, and so, you know, for example, as we look at, you know, six feet, um, you know, between, um, you know, between individuals is an acceptable space, that will vary um, depending on the size of the classroom. So we're not, um, you, know, you know, we're not providing with specificity, you know, class size, but the space that should be considered um, as we approach social distancing uh, and meet those guidelines. Thank you. Uh, Alex, Alex from Lancaster, you're on next, followed by Zach from Harrisburg CBS 21. Are you on, Alex? Do you mean Alex from NBC 27? No, I mean Alex from yes. Lancaster Newspaper. Got it, okay. <laughs> yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Thanks, Rick. Um, I was wondering if there was uh, going to be any additional financial support for schools that need to purchase masks and other supplies and equipment um, to help kind of soften the financial blow of all this? Mm -hmm. So what we've done to date is we provided guidance to school districts that this is an allowable expense under the additional federal CARES funding. Um, we've also, you know, in, in, you know, we've made sure to inform uh, both the administration and the General Assembly around, um, you know, the additional resources that could be needed um, you know, to address some of our expectations under social distancing. So I guess it's, it's multifaceted. First, as you know, the Department of Ed is more so a pass-through um, of, of, of funds as related to, um, you know, to, to state resources. But what we have done is worked with school districts to provide them, you know, some more specific guidance and we'll continue to provide guidance as to how they can utilize ESSER funding, um, how they can utilize some additional funding to leverage um, the resources that um, you know, that are needed. And also through work with the intermediate units, um, we're trying to find ways to mitigate um, you know, additional expenses. So for example, um, you know, in cases where we, will, where we were able, um, you know, to work with the IUs to assume the cost of the online platform, um, we did so and will continue to do so, so that schools, um, you know, aren't, aren't uh, you know, don't have to leverage their own funds to, to provide that um, system of support or in working with multiple school districts and um, their intermediate unit or patent systems, looking at um, what online and hybrid instruction may look like um, to take advantage of, um, you know, of, of broad school-based um, consortiums, or even to look at and identify best practice around um, how to leverage resources that uh, their students and communities need. So, you know, specifically in terms of funding, only what the state has provided traditionally, which the General Assembly has allowed um, for flat funding moving into, into the next year, um, but it will continue to advocate, um, you know, assess district needs and report to the General Assembly accordingly. Uh, Zach Sal, Zach from CBS 21, you're on, followed by Dickie Nasser from Pittsburgh's KDKA TV. Zach, are you on? We have everyone muted, so Zach, if you're on, you'll have to unmute yourself. Or do we have a representative from CBS 21 in Harrisburg? Okay, we will move on. Dickie Nasser from KDKA TV in Pittsburgh. We will move on. Ed Palatella from the Erie Times. Are you on, Ed? Ed, are we, are you on? We will move on to uh, Johnstown's WJAC-TV, Sierra Darville, are you on the call? Uh, we'll move on, I do see Avi. Avi, um, you're on next. Here, yes. Um, so I, I was curious, um, 
and I, there's so much that's been going on, it's hard to, sometimes you lose track, but I recall in the beginning this idea that, you know, counties and areas would have to be really in the green phase before we started talking about schools, and now we have this sort of yellow phase school plan. So did that change, and if so, why did it change? Why do we consider yellow phase areas to be, you know, safe for some form of, of in-person school? Uh, yes, there, there was a change, um, Avi. As, as you remember, um, the original guidance closed schools for the remainder of the school year, um, physically clo closed schools for the remainder of, school, of the school year. And school districts continue to provide um, instruction and provide support, you know, all throughout that time. Now that we're looking at, uh, you know, the, the in-person phase of closing schools, um, July 1st marks the start um, of the new school year. And so what we've done is we've worked with the administration, we've worked under, with the Department of Health to decouple the traditional guidance that was provided in, in response to COVID-19 to provide new guidance to educational institutions um, to allow for some level of instruction. So we're still going to be, you know, you know expecting and providing, um, you know, systems of support as we move into yellow um, and counties and, and districts within those counties move into green. But what we know and we learned firsthand um, as we've engaged this, many school districts are, are you know, kind of multi-county, uh, you know, impacted. And, and what happens in one school district has an absolute impact um, on the surrounding schools um, and school districts. So, you know, what we've done is we've taken We've taken the Department of Health guidance, the CTC guidance, and we've customized the guidance that we're providing the schools um, to best meet their needs. So just to, to provide greater specificity, you know, effective June 5th, um, higher ed institutions will, will be able to provide um, in-person instruction as long as they adhere to um, social distancing guidelines, you know, in alignment, um, you know, to, to the, the color-coded system of, of um, you know, of your area. And then um, effective July 1st, K-12 institutions are going to be able to start to provide in-person in instruction as long as they adhere to the guidance by the Department of Health um, and the CDC. So, um, so know that it's definitely an evolution, but primarily because the guidance that we put out in school district was effective up until the end of that, of that school calendar year. Our next question is from Ann Shannon from WGAL, followed by Gary Perna from Scranton's WBRE-TV. Ann, are you on? Good morning. Good morning. My question is, we, we've heard some talk about the possible resurgence or a second wave of COVID-19 coming this fall or winter. Are there concerns from the Department of Education that you will start the school year possibly with in-person instruction and then need to pull back to a virtual instruction once again? Yeah, and that's a great question. And, and as um, you know, we've been vocal and shared, we are preparing for the best in terms of, uh, you know, for, for the uh, planning for the best in terms of school opening, but we are preparing for the worst. And so pretty much the guidance that we've been putting out for school districts and what we've been working um, with all educational institutions to do is to ensure that um, the plans that they're putting in place um, you know, to focus on instruction, but also keeping students and sta staff health, safe and healthy are flexible. And, you know, I also want to take a, you know, take a moment to mention that everything we've done up to this point in support um, of educational institutions and providing online platforms and working with PBS to, um, you know, to enrich, um, you know, the, the, the television, the uh, uh, learning at home PA system in the professional development we've been providing um, our, our educators through um, the intermediate units and patent systems are strategies that can be employed if you go full in person to some hybrid event to you know, fully going um, offline and virtual um, virtually again. So the plans will be flexible, but every strategy we invested in to date is a strategy that can be utilized in every, every different type of modality um, of instructional delivery. So yes, I would have to say that is a concern, but it is a concern that we are proactively planning, um, planning around and, and ready to address. Our next question is gonna be from Scranton WBRE. Gary, are you on the call? No, we will... my name is Ray Bidia. I'm representing them today. Um, I just have a quick question. So we were talking I'm about- I'm sorry, can you um, speak up a little louder as you, you can probably hear in the background, um, the, the, the storm, 
um, you know, here in Lancaster County has started and it's pretty loud. I, I apologize. Sure, no problem. Um, so my question is regarding masks. So I spoke with a few superintendents in our area yesterday about this topic. And some of them told me that parents were concerned about sending their children to school um, in person with like if masks are mandatory. So my question is, what's your reaction to that? And um, are there other mandatory things that might come into place um, to prevent the spread as well? Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, and it's definitely um, has been taken into consideration in the guidance. You know, and I think, you know, much like you, when we were planning and preparing around this guidance, um, we solicited, um, you know, the feedback of parents and, and advocates as well. And there are all types of different circumstances and conditions that, um, you know, students, um, you know, and other individuals may not be able to wear masks, you know, in school if that's one of um, you know, the, the, as that's one of the conditions that we've set um, in school guidance. And as we shared that flexibility around the plans, school leaders have already started to take, um, take a look at that and take that into account as to what population of students and staff, you know, can readily wear masks and come to school, maintaining those social distancing guidelines and, and meet the robust nature of a plan, but also personalize and differentiate based on the needs um, of younger learners and based on the needs of some learners who may have um, special needs and special circumstances. So know that the plans that they are going to, to, to introduce to, to their community has taken pretty much all of that into consideration. And that's also why for us in the department, it, it's important that we provide um, you know, guidance but the flexibility for, for school leaders um, to customize their plans around their specific constituents, around their specific, um, you know, learners and, and, you know, and, and meet their needs accordingly. We're going to try Jan Murphy from the Harrisburg Patriot News, followed by Matt Toth from the Somerset Daily American. Jan, are you on? I hope. Am Jan, I? Can you now we're Jan. We're having a hard time hearing you. If it's okay with you, we'll just we'll ask you. Jan, we we can't hear you. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to read your question so that we can then answer that. So the question from the Patriot oh, News. Jan, no. Me now. Uh, now mute yourself, Jan. Thank you. Okay, we're going to read the question from Jan. It's uh, with regard to the health and safety plans for K-12, specifically, is the department looking to see in those plans, uh, when are they due, and do the, does the department encourage local school officials to seek public input in developing those plans in order to instill more confidence that students in school will be safe? Absolutely. So as we look specifically at the plans that schools are going to create, um, you know, for their communities, um, there are a number of expectations. First, um, plans are going to be due before um, schools resume instruction or before schools are operational again. Secondly, they're going to have to, um, you know, engage in a mechanism by which um, that school plan is, is engaged and vetted, um, you know, through their school board and, and, you know, in the process through the local community. But most importantly, um, school districts are going to have to post those plans online for, for public inspection um, and, you know, and so that uh, families can, can absolutely and in a predictable manner know what's going to be expected of them and their students as they return um, to all levels of, of, of instruction. So, so this is a plan that's expected to be comprehensive, expected to be a living plan and document, but most importantly, expected to be, uh, be communicated to the uh, community at large. Our next question is from Matt Toth at Somerset, followed by uh, Fox 29 in Philadelphia. Matt, are you on the call? Uh, yes, I am. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, what I want to ask is a lot of our superintendents around Somerset County are worried about transportation guidelines as far as the CDC. And I was wondering what the Department of Ed is recommending to the school districts as we move forward. Yeah, so what we've been doing, uh, you know, obviously we worked with the General Assembly um, and advocated for school districts to, to receive the transportation funding that, that ultimately um, was approved. Additionally, we've been looking at, at updating um, our system of transportating, transportation accounting so that the process by which they account and identify um, transportation routes, for example, um, are much more flexible um, and meet the needs of, of their 
um, you know, of, of their safety plan as it relates to transporting students to and from school. But ultimately, we, we know that guidelines by, um, by the CDC and the Department of Health as it relates to social distancing guidelines are definitely going to change, um, you know, the method and methodology by which we transport students um, to and from schools. And quite frankly, our system of instruction, if, if you know, the numbers and the cases don't continue to improve and, and looking at the conditions that are being created by COVID-19 now are going to have to continue to be flexible. So um, school leaders are absolutely you know, correct. Um, there, there's definitely going to be um, you know, some, some, some thoughts and significant hardships um, as they plan and prepare um, you know, transportation plans to, to engage social distancing. Um, but we also realize that we're working with them through our department um, to relieve those stressor, stressors however is needed you know, at, at a local level. Um, because even transportation varies. Um, you know, from, from district to district and community to community. So we're gonna, we're gonna work with them to, to provide whatever system of support and advocacy towards resources um, to that end accordingly. Our next question is from Fox 29 in Philadelphia, followed by WFMZ TV, uh, Jamie Snyder. Do we have a representative from Fox 29? Someone from Fox 29 in Philly? Okay, we'll move on. Do we have a representative from WFMZ TV? Moving on, Chris English from the Bucks County paper. Are you on, Chris? We will move to John Finnerty. Are you on? John? Yes, I'm here. You're, okay, John, you're, 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 yep, go ahead. Yeah, I, I wondered if you could kind of talk to your timeline as far as that. Can you hear me? I'm here. What's that? No, that was. I'm here, of... Chris English. Uh, we'll get you next, Chris. Go ahead, John. Uh, yeah, you have the July 1st date, but obviously with schools being closed, I. I... John, I think we lost you. Are you still on? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, we didn't hear your question. If you can repeat it. start early because they closed or are you expecting them to, to be on pretty much the normal schedule? From what I'm hearing already from district leaders um, is that, um, you know, us identifying in consultation with them, July 1st being, being the, the um, you know, available start date, um, they're looking at, um, you know, definitely a different uh, calendar, school calendar uh, for the start of the school year. I think many school districts, if not most school districts, we see, um, you know, across the Commonwealth are going to look at, um, you know, a different schedule than they historically have. So, so the answer to your question, John, do we think they're just going to go to the traditional, um, you know, system of instruction? I, I don't think so. But, but also understand that depending on the needs of those of, of the local community, um, you know, school districts are engaging and taking that into account. So, for example, um, you know, will they start with enrichment activities um, before traditional um, start of the calendar? That's one strategy. Um, will they start, um, you know, around, you know, the needs of local business and workforce? That's another consideration that, um, that has been given. And then lastly, what will the school year look like um, as they address, um, you know, the current numbers of, of this pandemic, you know, to potential um, you know, increases or decreases moving forward. But, you know, I can, I, can, I can share with you the conversations that we've had with school, with, with system leaders, um, early childhood, K-12 and higher ed has absolutely um, taken into account the flexibility provided um, by, this, by this calendar year and are, are planning and responding accordingly. Uh, Chris, uh, you're on Chris English, followed by the Delaware County Times. Go ahead, Chris. Chris, are you there? Okay, it looks like we may have lost Chris. Kathleen Carey from the Delaware County Times, are you on? Okay, we're Mark Scofor. Yeah, the here. news release really sent out mentions. Uh, wait, who, wait, 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 who's talking? Wait, who's talking? Yeah. Wait, who's talking? Who is this? Is this Chris? Who's? Chris may be muting and unmuting himself off, uh, off cycle. Okay. 
Uh, okay, well, Chris, if you jump back on, we'll get you. Kathleen Carey from the Delaware County Times, are you on? Mark, are you on? Skoforo. Yes, thank you. Uh, my question is, as to the start of the school year, I'm, uh, I'm interested in the uh, topic of hybrid education and alternatives. As it stands today, are school districts in green or yellow free to, for example, have a plan that does not have all students in the buildings in in-person education on day one? Yes, great question, Mark. Um, as, of, as of the school opening guidelines, schools can choose to, on day one, start the school year um, you know, through a hybrid model. Uh, you know, what we've done is we've worked really hard to build uh, uh, an infrastructure and a system of support um, you know, to engage and, and support um, you know, virtual instruction. So, so on day one, in response to the current conditions, schools can choose um, you know, to, um, to draft and communicate a plan to their community. Um, that's it, that, that is a hybrid model, um, you know, instructional plan. So yes, they can. Uh, our next question will be from Sarah uh, from the Scranton Times, followed by Mary Niederberger from Pittsburgh Current. Sarah, are you on? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? We can, go ahead. For the higher education, is there an expectation that students can return to residence halls um, this fall, or are we looking at um, you know, keeping kids maybe for now? Yeah, so, so uh, great question. So as part of the higher education guidance, um, we've taken into account um, res life as, as well as um, instructional programming. Um, and so, you know, there are considerations that, that, you know, that have to be given as higher education leaders, um, you know, look to open up, um, you know, those experiences and opportunities for students. But at the end of the day, there is a pathway by which um, higher education, uh, you know, presidents and, um, you know, and, and their stakeholders can look, um, you know, to provide that, that res life experiences to, um, to students. Mary, are you on from Pittsburgh Current? I'm on, can you hear me? We can, uh, hold on a second. We're gonna go with Mary, then we're gonna go with Lindsay from New York Dispatch, followed by WPBI-TV in Philly. Go ahead, Mary. Um, okay, I think for districts that, you know, whether they want everybody in school the first day or they want hybrid plans, I just wonder what they're going to be able to do to protect both students and teachers who are immunocompromised. How are they gonna be able to participate in any plan that has students in the classroom? Mm -hmm. Mary, that's, that's a great question. And whereas um, the guidance provides lots of strategies to, to support um, you know, all learners and the, and the staff um, you know, around potentially being in, in compromised um, you know, positions, but, but know this, we, we didn't draft this. I, you know, I was really, um, I did take a moment to share earlier that um, you know, we engage stakeholders but, but also know that um, we specifically engage public health professionals um, and health researchers to, you know, to, to um, develop, to help identify strategies for, um, you know, immuno and, and also um, other at-risk, um, you know, students and, and families. And so the guidance absolutely provides some pathways for, um, for those individuals. But ultimately, I think, you know, one of the areas that, that has been highlighted through this whole pandemic is how schools and school systems continued um, to follow through and follow up with the relationship um, of their community members. And we heard time after time how, um, how educators and, and educational leaders connected with families, especially families who have students that fall within some of our most vulnerable um, you know, designations, you know, to both, you know, identify their needs around continuity of education, but continue to support a plan um, for not only those students in coming back, but the implications of that plans for the families when they go back home. So, so twofold, one, we engage, um, you know, the professionals to ask, um, you know, and, and to engage in that research specifically, but also, you know, part of what we've been, what we've been advising and we see is that um, school systems, um, you know, continue to work, um, you know, with, with their families to, to um, you know, to, uh, to use the design plans to specifically meet the needs 
um, of those students and, and, the, and you know, the folks within that household. Lindsay from York Dispatch, are you on? Followed by Philadelphia's WPVI TV. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Go ahead. Hi. Um, I know that um, school districts have been already looking at um, what uh, personal protective equipment or safety measures um, they need to put in and possibly looking at talking to other districts and um, I use to um, see if they can buy those in bulk. Um, so that they can save some money in that regard. I was just wondering if, if part of the guidance or if there will be a list released of just what's absolutely necessary that all districts need to make sure they buy so they can make sure that um, they start purchasing now. Yep. So, so that's a you know, great question you know, as well, Lindsay. And, and you've probably heard that we've been working with our intermediate units. So at now, at least at this level, to engage superintendents um, around the, the equipment that's identified through um, you know, through the guidance to see if they can take advantage of consortia within, um, you know, within those IU areas to bring down cost. Um, we have also been working with the intermediate units. We've been working in the Department of Education and also engaging um, some of the other state agencies under, um, under the governor's administration to see if we can find ways, you know, to look at um, state procurement systems um, to bring down costs from everything from PPE, you know, to, to masks, to even cleaning supplies. So it hasn't been as, as you know, as, as, uh, as fluid as, as we'd like, you know, to, you know, to engage. But this is really, you know, we've been really thinking outside the box to see how we as a state can support all institutions of education to help, um, you know, mitigate some of, some of the, the major um, increases in cost that are associated with this pandemic. So we have, uh, we, we have systems and processes that are put in place right now for the short term, but we're also working with other state agencies to see if we can come up with a long-term solution to bring down cost um, for schools and school districts and uh, institutions of higher ed. Our next question, do we have a representative from Philadelphia's WPBI-TV, followed by Johnstown's WTAG-TV? Do we have Candace Rumor from Philadelphia, WPVI. How about Jody Gill from Johnstown's WTAJ? Hi, this is actually Colleen Knutson from WTAJ. Okay. Just a quick question. A lot of um, the primary schools in our area are a bit smaller, and some of them have some concerns about social distancing aspect and making sure students stay safe apart in the classroom, they're not able to really stick within those six feet guidelines, especially when they're teaching in the classrooms, the recommendation to stay fully remote. So, so that's, um, you know, that's exactly the scenario um, that we took into account when we solicited feedback around the guidance we're going to provide. Um, you know, continuing remote learning, um, you know, until, uh, you know, the, the data supports um, you know, bringing students back to school, especially in some of those areas where they just can't socially distance themselves is an option. But, you know, also know that it ha doesn't have to be that absolute, which is, which is exactly what we're communicating. You know, as I shared, best case scenario, all kids come to school in the traditional setting. There is no color-coded system and we're ready for business as usual. You know, worst case scenario in this case is we continue with full, um, you know, online virtual instruction um, you know, for communities as we currently are, but there are opportunities within this guidance, um, you know, to customize um, everywhere in between based on the needs of that specific community. And, you know, those needs are physical space, those needs are proximity, um, you know, to, to, you know, equipment and supplies, you know, that space is, um, you know, whether or not um, you have the, the you know, the, the, uh, the, the professionals and the staff in place um, to provide a system of support. And so what the, the, you know, the uh, primary grade schools in your area can do, um, you know, is through this plan is communicate to the community that, um, you know, because they can't meet, um, you know, best case scenario, here's a hybrid approach, um, you know, to, to continue to support um, student learning um, and family services, um, you, know, in, in, you know, until, um, you know, COVID-19 is no longer the issue that forces us, uh, you know, to, you know, to, to, a drop, to adjust and, uh, and, and provide remediation. Uh, do we, our next question is from KDKA Radio in Pittsburgh, followed by Sharon Youngstown's WKBN-TV. KDKA Radio, are you on? 
Do we have a representative from Sharon's Youngstown WKBN TV? Yes, my question is following up on what you just said about this model. There's going to be some parents who don't want to send their kids back. They want to keep them at home. Are these districts mandated to still provide the optional learning? Because I don't want to find out June 30th and have to scramble to find another school district for a kid. Yeah, great question, Dave. One of the considerations under the plan is understanding that not every, not every family may want to or be able to um, send their kids physically back to school. So that is one of the considerations um, that school districts are giving the families. Um, you know, whether or not, you know, they continue, um, you know, to see, uh, you know, to, to offer that hybrid model. I know we at the state are, are continuing to work to provide um, that hybrid, um, you know, instructional model moving forward. We're, we're now working to, to identify the resources that we need um, to provide the online instruction accordingly. And also um, knowing that, um, you know, also knowing that, you know, schools are going to have to engage um, their, you know, their community, um, you know, their schools are going to have to engage their, their communities and, and their specific needs through this plan. It's just going to have to be customized for, for those families accordingly. Okay, our next question is from uh, Corey Clark at PCN TV, followed by uh, Andrew Carr at Pittsburgh's WPXI TV. Corey, are you on? Yes, can you hear me? We can, go ahead. Uh, okay, so you, you laid out the guidelines and they have to be put up on the website, but is there a, an approval process? Who makes the final decision? Yep, so this process is going to be a district run and navigated process with their school boards and submitted online. The Department of Education is, is, uh, is, is not in a place to, to be honest with you, um, Corey, but, but not, um, you know, not, not going to provide formal approval of these plans, um, just guidance, um, direction, and then also, um, you know, making it available to, to communities as well. I, I think, you know, it, what's important to, to understand as we develop this guidance and as we're pushing it out, we've tried to provide guidance that schools, you know, again, early childhood through higher ed, um, can create school opening, um, you know, processes, of, you know, in alignment with the guidelines for communities that um, have rural schools as, 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 you know, as small as, you know, 55 students to large urban communities um, that have schools, um, you know, that serve, you know, 4,000 plus students. And so in doing that, we needed to provide, you know, the conditions, but, um, you know, ultimately know that that school board and that administrative team um, in consultation with their community members are in the best place to create a plan that focuses on the needs of their families um, and, and their in their community. So, so whereas, and I think it's important to say that there isn't uh, an approval process for the plan, there are required elements as part of this plan. So, so there are some non-negotiables and um, that they have to include. Our next question is from Pittsburgh's WPXI TV, followed by uh, Mark Dydish at the Wilkes-Barre Times Leader. Uh, Andrew Carr, are you on? Um, so this is Jillian Hartman with WPXI. Can you guys hear me? We can, go ahead. Great, so we've been hearing from a lot of parents and students as to what will be the plan with after school activities, with clubs, with sports. Um, that means a lot to these families and these kids. So what's the plan for after school activities in the fall? So, um, so traditional enrichment activities. So after school activities, there are guidance um, that we are providing um, to, to allow schools and school districts to plan um, around, um, around those activities that, that you just you know, specifically mentioned. Now, you know, at the same token, I, I also wanna make sure that we don't confuse individuals. While we're providing this guidance, the PIAA and other um, you know, collegiate sports um, associations are creating guidance for, um, you know, for, that, for the sanctioned um, traditional athletic um, you know, uh, systems as well. And whereas um, you know, we, 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 we're, we have representatives and are working with them to provide that, but we're going to be providing guidance for the, for the non-sanctioned type of, type of enrichment activities, but also guidance now for sanctioned activities will be coming out soon as well. Our next question is from Mark Guides from the Wilkes-Barre Times Leader, followed by Robert Swift at Capital Wire. Mark, are you on? What about Robert from Capital Wire? 
We'll move on to uh, Nick LaBelle from the Puxatani Spirit. Nick, are you on? Joe Crest from the Carlisle Sentinel. Are you on? Uh, yes. Um, I have a couple questions. Um, Go ahead and answer. Go ahead and ask your first question. Okay. Uh, will students be required to undergo temperature checks upon arrival at school? So temperature checks are one of the strategies that, um, that, that we've identified in this guidance. You know, ultimately it's, it's, um, you know, it's one of the areas that the school districts may choose um, to employ, um, you know, along with many of the other guidance areas to, um, you know, for their schools. But that is one of the strategies in the guidance document. And the second part of that is what happens if the temperature check comes back with a fever? I mean, what happens to the kid if the kid's already at the building? Part of, part of this guidance is that school districts have to communicate, um, you know, a remediation plan, um, you know, should individuals, um, you know, be, be diagnosed or exhibit um, the, um, you know, the conditions, the, um, uh, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the conditions associated um, with COVID-19. So what we're also going to be, um, you know, providing, as I shared, this is a living document based on the current research, um, you know, and data. And, you know, specifically what's going to be coming out is future guidance around, um, you know, or guidance with a little more specificity around monitoring and remediation of, um, you know, of conditions. So, so it's absolutely something to be included as part of the plan. And as the research and the data um, continues to inform us, we're going to provide more, um, you know, more guidance um, in consideration to, um, you know, to the education community. Thank you. Our next question is from Julia at the Pittsburgh Business Times, followed by Kristen at the Inquirer. Julia, are you on? Yes, can you hear me? We can, go ahead. Um, I, I noticed that you said the date of, the Jul of July 1st for K through 12 was about the start of the school year. Um, how did you choose the date for the higher ed um, institutions? Um, so the date for the higher ed institutions really aligned, um, you know, to the, to the governor's, um, you know, expectation of, of um, you know, the, the, um, the, the Department of Health's color coding system. So, you know, as I shared earlier on the call, um, we work really closely with, with other departments and other agencies um, in government as we were identifying dates um, that, that June 5th date, um, you know, pretty much aligned to the date when many other, um, you know, type of businesses and, and industry, um, you know, would be looking um, to open under, under the um, yellow to green conditions. Our next question is from Kristen Graham at the Inquirer, followed by uh, Lawrence Binda at the Harrisburg Burg News. Kristen, are you on? I am on. Go ahead. Hi, Secretary. Um, I'm wondering a little bit about the July 1st date and what that means in terms of extended school year and summer school. Are we expecting that some districts will have in-person um, ESY and summer school? I mean, I know there are issues, obviously, for, for vulnerable populations. Um, you know, what have you heard from districts so far and what do you expect will happen? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great, great question, um, Kristen, and, um, you know, thanks. I think, you know, first and foremost, uh, you know, in identifying July 1st at the start, um, you know, the new school year, it's not an extension of, of the previous school year, but many school districts are already, um, you know, engaging and providing, whether they're starting, um, you know, full instruction to looking at enrichment instruction, or even, um, you know, personalized instruction based on, um, you know, the specific needs of students. But there are school districts that have signaled to us, um, because they're working on their plans already, um, that, um, you know, that they're going to submit um, to start uh, to start some form of instruction, um, you know, close to that July 1st deadline. So um, it could it, it could and will absolutely signal that some school districts will provide some level of instruction. Early. And you know, there are still some districts at the same time who who signal they they won't you know they won't be able to for a myriad of reasons. But um, but but some absolutely are. Our next question is from Lawrence Binda from the Harrisburg Bird News. Lawrence, are you on? What about Holly Patterson from The Record Argus? Good morning. Um, my question is regarding um, the early childhood education aspect and how it's going to play into, um, you know, success by six and uh, the Head Start programs and things like that. How will that affect uh, what's going to happen here in the fall and those programs that have not taken place here over the summer? 
Um, so when we look specifically at, at early childhood um, opportunities, we, we've, um, our guidance is differentiated um, between um, you know, traditional early childhood programs that uh, were offered outside of the school system and early childhood programs that are offered um, you know, within the school system. So, so the guidance that's going to be forthcoming um, you know, will we'll take all of that into consideration. Um, and even non, you know, some of the other child care programs, I know, um, you know, as I, as I mentioned earlier, this has not been done, um, you know, in a vacuum, this plan. We've, um, we've partnered with, with uh, you know, my colleague and, and our colleague with the Department of Human Services um, to make sure that the guidance that they're and we are providing are, are closely aligned. So um, that's going to be, if, uh, you know, that's going to be released and updated, um, you know, as, as, as the research and the data suggests. Our next question is from Mike DiNardo at KYW News Radio, um, followed by Representative Scranton's WBRE TV. Mike, are you on? Do we have a representative from Scranton's WBRE TV? I see somebody, uh, Ravatha, are you there? Hi, I already asked my question earlier. Okay, then we'll move on. Samantha Beal from the Butler Eagle, are you on? And uh, what about Kent Jackson from the Hazleton paper? Kent, are you on? And what about Kristen Smith from the centersquare.com? What about Alex Peterson from Harrisburg ABC 27? We will move down. Karen Mansfield from the Washington Observer Reporter. What about Marlena Zappil from NBC 10 in Philadelphia? Okay, I think we have a question from uh, Lizzie. Are you on, Lizzie? Yeah, hi guys. Can hi. Yeah, we can hear you. This will be the last question for our press conference. Go ahead, Lizzie. Okay, uh, thank you all so much. Um, so I wanted to know, do you anticipate any workforce challenges coming into the fall, whether it's teachers seeking early retirement, not wanting to come back to school if they're immunocompromised, or districts being forced to cut paid positions to plug budget gaps um and is there any like regulatory relief you can enact to like i don't know bring more teachers into classrooms whether it's volunteers or like um waiving some licensing requirements and i also just want to ask you um i know that the school code or i'm fairly certain it reinstituted the 180 day instruction requirement that legislators waived earlier this year uh what does that mean and how does that affect educators this year, especially if there has to be a transition to online instruction? Yeah, so, so great grouping of questions. Um, I'll start with the last question and then kind of cycle, um, cycle through. So, so I did make a request to the, to the General Assembly um, that they again consider providing me um, and the Department Waiver Authority um, to address conditions such as the 109, 180 days, 990 hours. Um, to address considerations of other uh, mandates that just may not be um, attainable um, as, as we go into the, the continued COVID-19 um, era of education. Um, I'm hopeful, um, you know, you know at, at start, we had not yet uh, seen a signal that they were going to provide that uh, mandate relief, but there has been conversation around providing that to us. So I'm going to continue to work um, and advocate um, to the General Assembly to, um, you know, to, to allow us to do so. And, and you know, and, and this is where I have to commend them. I mean, the first time through, they identified, um, you know, what, um, you know, what we needed and what um, our schools needed and, um, and, and supported us. And, and so I'm confident, um, you know, that they'll be able to do so again. Um, but I think what's most important to know is that um, we, we have heard of the school community um, loud and clear, and we're going to continue um, to advocate for, um, you know, for, for, you know for, for some of that relief. Um, and, and, you know, along those lines, as we looked at um, specifically the need, um, you know, to identify teachers into vacancies um, and, you know, and just continued, um, you know, uh, needs within our classrooms um, throughout this year, we were able to provide relief um, and certification standards for 
um, you know, emergency certification level one to level two. Um, you, we understand that Praxis is providing an online um, you know, module for student teachers, but we're also looking at systems of support for student teachers as well as they look to enter the classrooms. Um, you know, one of my you know, many visits uh, virtually over the summer had been with, um, you know, with students who are completing student teaching and, um, you know, and, and getting ready to enter the workforce as they graduate. Um, you know, from, you know, from, from post-secondary institutions. And, you know, I heard them loud and clear around what they needed from us at the department, but also what other systems of support we should consider putting in place for them as they enter the classroom. Um, and, and we're working um, on strategies to address that as well. So, you know, we're, we're extremely hopeful and optimistic that the General Assembly will allow mandate relief that will not only help us, you know, kind of um, you know, chip away at some of the unattainable mandates that exist in an outdated, um, you know, school code and law, but allow us to create the conditions that keep teachers in the classroom, put teachers in the classroom, and attract more teachers into, um, you know, into the learning profession. So it's, it's all of that is definitely a work in progress.